Chapter 10 The Nature of Poetry, Art, and the Philosopher's Role Among the many admirable qualities I see in the structure of our state, there is one that particularly pleases me upon reflection, and that is the rule regarding poetry. What do you mean? I am referring to the rejection of imitative poetry, which should not be accepted, as I now see more clearly after distinguishing the different parts of the soul. What do you mean by that? Speaking in confidence, for I would not want my words to be repeated to the tragedians and other imitators, but I don't mind telling you, all poetic imitations are harmful to the understanding of the listeners, and the only antidote to them is knowledge of their true nature. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, I will tell you, although I have always had a sense of awe and love for Homer since I was young, which still affects me today, for he is the great leader and teacher of the entire tragic group. However, a person should not be revered more than the truth, and therefore I will speak honestly. Very well, he said. Listen to me then, or rather, respond to me. Ask your question. Can you tell me what imitation is? Because I really do not know. It is likely that I would know. Why not? Sometimes a person with less insight may see something sooner than someone with sharper senses. Very true, he said. But in your presence, even if I had any vague notion, I could not gather the courage to express it. Will you investigate yourself? Well then, shall we begin the investigation in our usual way? Whenever a group of individuals have a common name, we assume that they also have a corresponding idea or form. Do you understand me? I do. Let us take any common example. There are beds and tables in the world, plenty of them, right? Yes. But there are only two ideas or forms of them, one the idea of a bed, the other of a table. True. And the maker of either of them makes a bed or he makes a table for our use, in accordance with the idea, that is how we speak in this and similar cases, but no craftsman makes the ideas themselves, how could he? Impossible. And there is another artist, I would like to know what you would say about him. Who is he? He is the creator of all the works of all other craftsmen. What an extraordinary person. Wait a little, and there will be more reason for your saying so. Because this is the person who is able to make not only objects of every kind, but plants and animals, himself and all other things, the earth and sky, and the things which are in the sky or under the earth, he makes the gods too. He must be a sorcerer, without a doubt. Oh. You are skeptical, are you? Do you mean that there is no such maker or creator, or that in one sense there might be a maker of all these things, but in another not? Do you see that there is a way in which you could make them all yourself? What way? An easy way enough, or rather, there are many ways in which the feat might be quickly and easily accomplished. None quicker than that of turning a mirror round and round, you would soon enough make the sun and the sky, and the earth and yourself, and other animals and plants, and all the other things of which we were just now speaking, in the mirror. Yes, he said, but they would be appearances only. Very good, I said, you are coming to the point now. And the painter too is, as I understand, just such another, a creator of appearances, is he not? Of course. But then I suppose you will say that what he creates is untrue. And yet there is a sense in which the painter also creates a bed? Yes, he said, but not a real bed. And what of the maker of the bed? Were you not saying that he too makes, not the idea which, according to our view, is the essence of the bed, but only a particular bed? Yes, I did. Then if he does not make that which exists, he cannot make true existence but only some semblance of existence, and if anyone were to say that the work of the maker of the bed, or of any other craftsman, has real existence, he could hardly be supposed to be speaking the truth. At any rate, he replied, philosophers would say that he was not speaking the truth. No wonder, then, that his work too is an unclear expression of truth. No wonder. Suppose now that by the light of the examples just offered, we inquire who this imitator is? If you please. Well then, here are three beds, one existing in nature, 
which is made by God, as I think that we may say, for no one else can be the maker? No. There is another which is the work of the carpenter. Yes. And the work of the painter is a third? Yes. Beds, then, are of three kinds, and there are three artists who oversee them, God, the maker of the bed, and the painter? Yes, there are three of them. God, whether by choice or by necessity, made one bed in nature and one only. Two or more such ideal beds neither ever have been nor ever will be made by God. Why is that? Because even if he had made but two, a third would still appear behind them which both of them would have for their idea, and that would be the ideal bed and not the two others. Very true, he said. God knew this, and he desired to be the real maker of a real bed, not a specific maker of a specific bed, and therefore he created a bed which is essentially and by nature one only. So, we believe. Shall we, then, speak of him as the natural author or maker of the bed? Yes, he replied, since by the natural process of creation he is the author of this and of all other things. And what shall we say of the carpenter, is he also the maker of the bed? Yes. But would you call the painter a creator and maker? Certainly not. Yet if he is not the maker, what is he in relation to the bed? I think, he said, that we may fairly designate him as the imitator of that which the others make. Good, I said, then you call him who is third in the descent from nature an imitator? Certainly, he said. And the tragic poet is a mimic, and therefore, like all other mimics, he is three times removed from the king and from the truth? That appears to be so. Then about the mimic we are agreed. And what about the painter, I would like to know whether he may be thought to imitate that which originally exists in nature, or only the creations of artists? The latter. As they are, or as they appear. You have still to determine this. What do you mean? I mean, that you may look at a bed from different points of view, obliquely or directly or from any other point of view, and the bed will appear different, but there is no difference. And the same of all things. Yes, he said, the difference is only apparent. Now let me ask you another question, which is the art of painting designed to be an imitation of things as they are, or as they appear, of appearance or of reality? Of appearance. Then the mimic, I said, is a long way off the truth, and can do all things, because he lightly touches on a small part of them, and that part an image. For example, a painter will paint a cobbler, carpenter, or any other artist, though he knows nothing of their arts, and, if he is a good artist, he may deceive children or simple persons, when he shows them his picture of a carpenter from a distance, and they will fancy that they are looking at a real carpenter. Certainly. And whenever anyone informs us that he has found a man who knows all the arts, and all things else that anybody knows, and every single thing with a higher degree of accuracy than any other man, whoever tells us this, I think that we can only imagine him to be a simple creature who is likely to have been deceived by some wizard or actor whom he met, and whom he thought all-knowing, because he himself was unable to analyze the nature of knowledge and ignorance and imitation. Most true. And so, when we hear persons saying that the tragedians, and Homer, who is at their head, know all the arts and all things human, virtue as well as vice, and divine things too, for that the good poet cannot compose well unless he knows his subject, and that he who has not this knowledge can never be a poet, we ought to consider whether here also there may not be a similar illusion. Perhaps they may have come across mimics and been deceived by them, they may not have remembered when they saw their works that these were but imitations three times removed from the truth, and could easily be made without any knowledge of the truth, because they are appearances only and not realities? Or, after all, they may be in the right, and poets do really know the things about which they seem to the many to speak so well? The question, he said, should be considered. Now do you suppose that if a person were able to make the original as well as the image, he would seriously devote himself to the image-making branch? Would he allow imitation to be the ruling principle of his life, as if he had nothing higher in him? I should say not. The real artist, who knew what he was imitating, 
would be interested in realities and not in imitations, and would desire to leave as memorials of himself works many and fair, and, instead of being the author of encomiums, he would prefer to be the theme of them. Yes, he said, that would be to him a source of much greater honor and profit. Then, I said, we must put a question to Homer, not about medicine, or any of the arts to which his poems only incidentally refer, we are not going to ask him, or any other poet, whether he has cured patients like Asclepius, or left behind him a school of medicine such as the Asclepiads were, or whether he only talks about medicine and other arts at second hand, but we have a right to know respecting military tactics, politics, education, which are the chiefs and noblest subjects of his poems. And we may fairly ask him about them. Friend Homer, then we say to him, if you are only in the second remove from truth in what you say of virtue, and not in the third, not an image maker or mimic, and if you are able to discern what pursuits make men better or worse in private or public life, tell us what state was ever better governed by your help. The good order of Lacedaemon is due to Lycurgus, and many other cities great and small have been similarly benefited by others, but who says that you have been a good legislator to them and have done them any good? Italy and Sicily boast of Carondas, and there is Solon who is renowned among us, but what city has anything to say about you? Is there any city which he might name? I think not, said Glaucon, not even the Homerids themselves pretend that he was a legislator. Well, but is there any war on record which was carried on successfully by him, or aided by his counsels, when he was alive? There is not. Or is there any invention of his, applicable to the arts or to human life, such as Thales the Milesian or Anacarsis the Scythian, and other ingenious men, have conceived, which is attributed to him? There is absolutely nothing of the kind. But, if Homer never did any public service, was he privately a guide or teacher of any? Had he in his lifetime friends who loved to associate with him, and who handed down to posterity a Homeric way of life, such as was established by Pythagoras who was so greatly beloved for his wisdom, and whose followers are to this day quite celebrated for the order which was named after him. Nothing of the kind is recorded of him. For surely, Socrates, Creophilus, the companion of Homer, that child of flesh, whose name always makes us laugh, might be more justly ridiculed for his stupidity, if, as is said, Homer was greatly neglected by him and others in his own day when he was alive? Yes, I replied, that is the tradition. But can you imagine, Glaucon, that if Homer had really been able to educate and improve mankind, if he had possessed knowledge and not been a mere imitator, can you imagine, I say, that he would not have had many followers, and been honored and loved by them? Protagoras of Abdera, and Prodicus of CEOs, and a host of others, have only to whisper to their contemporaries, you will never be able to manage either your own house or your own state until you appoint us to be your ministers of education, and this ingenious device of theirs has such an effect in making men love them that their companions all but carry them about on their shoulders. And is it conceivable that the contemporaries of Homer, or again of Hesiod, would have allowed either of them to go about as rhapsodists, if they had really been able to make mankind virtuous? Would they not have been as unwilling to part with them as with gold, and have compelled them to stay at home with them? Or, if the master would not stay, then the disciples would have followed him about everywhere, until they had got education enough? Yes, Socrates, that, I think, is quite true. Then must we not infer that all these poetical individuals, beginning with Homer, are only imitators, they copy images of virtue and the like, but the truth they never reach? The poet is like a painter who, as we have already observed, will make a likeness of a cobbler, though he understands nothing of cobbling, and his picture is good enough for those who know no more than he does, and judge only by colors and figures. Quite so. In like manner the poet, with his words and phrases, may be said to lay on the colors of the several arts, himself understanding their nature only enough to imitate them, and other people, who are as ignorant as he is, and judge only from his words, Imagine that if he speaks of cobbling, or of military tactics, or of anything else, in meter and harmony and rhythm, he speaks very well, such as the sweet influence which melody and rhythm by nature have. 
And I think that you must have observed again and again what a poor appearance the tales of poets make when stripped of the colors which music puts upon them and recited in simple prose. Yes, he said. They are like faces, which were never beautiful, but only blooming, and now the bloom of youth has passed away from them. Exactly. Here is another point. The imitator or maker of the image knows nothing of true existence. He knows appearances only. Am I not, right? Yes. Then let us have a clear understanding, and not be satisfied with half an explanation. Proceed. Of the painter we say that he will paint rains, and he will paint a bit. Yes. And the worker in leather and brass will make them? Certainly. But does the painter know the right form of the bit and reins? Nay, hardly even the workers in brass and leather who make them, only the horseman who knows how to use them, he knows their right form. Most true. And may we not say the same of all things? What? That there are three arts which are concerned with all things, one which uses, another which makes, a third which imitates them. Yes. And the excellence or beauty or truth of every structure, animate or inanimate, and of every action of man, is relative to the use for which nature or the artist has intended them. True. Then the user of them must have the greatest experience of them, and he must indicate to the maker the good or bad qualities which develop themselves in use. For example, the flute player will tell the flute maker which of his flutes is satisfactory to the performer, he will tell him how he ought to make them, and the other will attend to his instructions. Of course. The one knows and therefore speaks with authority about the goodness and badness of flutes, while the other, confiding in him, will do what he is told by him. True. The instrument is the same, but about the excellence or badness of it the maker will only attain to a correct belief, and this he will gain from him who knows, by talking to him and being compelled to hear what he has to say, whereas the user will have knowledge? True. But will the imitator have either? Will he know from use whether or no his drawing is correct or beautiful? Or will he have right opinion from being compelled to associate with another who knows and gives him instructions about what he should draw? Neither. Then he will no more have true opinion than he will have knowledge about the goodness or badness of his imitations. I suppose not. The imitative artist will have a deep understanding of his own creations, right? No, quite the opposite. He will continue to imitate without knowing what makes something good or bad and will only imitate what appears good to the ignorant masses. So, we can agree that the imitator has little knowledge of what he imitates. Imitation is merely a form of play or entertainment, and the tragic poets, whether they write in iambic or heroic verse, are the highest degree of imitators. That is true. Now, let me ask you, what is imitation directed towards in humans? What do you mean? Allow me to explain, an object that appears large up close will appear small from a distance, correct? True. And the same object will appear straight when viewed out of water, but crooked when in water. The concave becomes convex due to the illusion of colors that our sight is susceptible to. Thus, confusion arises within us, which is the weakness of the human mind that can be exploited by tricks of light and shadow. That is true. However, the arts of measuring, counting, and weighing come to the aid of human understanding. They allow us to see beyond the apparent size or weight and rely on calculation and measurement instead. That is very true. And this is the work of the rational principle in the soul, right? Of course. And when this principle determines that some things are equal or greater or lesser than others, there may appear to be a contradiction. True. But we have already established that such a contradiction is impossible. The same ability cannot hold opposite opinions about the same thing at the same time. Very true. So, the part of the soul that opposes measure is not the same as the part that aligns with it. True. And the better part of the soul is likely the one that relies on measure and calculation. Certainly. The part that opposes them is one of the inferior principles of the soul. No doubt. 
This was the conclusion I was trying to reach when I said that painting or drawing, and imitation in general, are far from truth. They are companions of a principle within us that is equally far from reason, and they have no true or healthy aim. Exactly. The imitative art is an inferior partner that produces inferior offspring. Very true. Does this apply only to sight, or does it extend to hearing as well, specifically to what we call poetry? It is likely the same would be true of poetry. Let us not rely on probability derived from the analogy of painting. Instead, let us examine further whether the ability with which poetical imitation is concerned is good or bad. By all means. We can state the question as follows. Imitation imitates the actions of humans, whether voluntary or involuntary, and they believe that these actions lead to either good or bad results, causing them to rejoice or sorrow accordingly. Is there anything else? No, that is all. But in this variety of circumstances, are these individuals in harmony with themselves? Or, as with sight, do they experience confusion and opposition in their opinions about the same things? Similarly, is there not conflict and inconsistency in their lives? We have already admitted that the soul is full of these oppositions and many others occurring simultaneously. And we were right, he said. Yes, we were right so far, but there was an omission that needs to be addressed now. What was the omission? Did we not say that a good person, who unfortunately loses their child or something else dear to them, will bear the loss with more composure than another? Yes. But will they have no sorrow, or shall we say that, although they cannot help but sorrow, they will moderate their sorrow? The latter is the more accurate statement. Tell me, will they be more likely to struggle and resist their sorrow when they are seen by others or when they are alone? It will make a significant difference whether they are seen or not. When they are alone, they will not mind saying or doing things that they would be ashamed of if anyone were to hear or see them. True. There is a principle of law and reason in them that urges them to resist, as well as a feeling of their misfortune that compels them to indulge in sorrow. True. But when a person is pulled in two opposite directions, towards and away from the same object, this implies two distinct principles within them as we have asserted. Certainly. One of these principles is ready to follow the guidance of the law. What do you mean? The law would suggest that being patient under suffering is best, and that we should not give in to impatience because we cannot determine whether such things are good or evil. Impatience gains us nothing, and grief hinders us from what is most needed in the moment. What is most needed? He asked. We should consider what has happened and, like when the dice are rolled, organize our affairs in the way that reason deems best. Instead of clinging to the part that is hurt and wasting time in crying, we should immediately train our souls to apply a remedy. We should lift that which is weak and fallen, banishing the cry of sorrow through the healing art. Yes, he said, that is the true way of facing the attacks of fortune. Yes, I said, and the higher principle is ready to follow the suggestion of reason? Clearly. And the other principle, which inclines us to remember our troubles and to lament, and can never have enough of them, we may call irrational, useless, and cowardly? Indeed, we may. And does not the latter, I mean the rebellious principle, provide a great variety of materials for imitation? Whereas the wise and calm temperament, being always nearly consistent, is not easy to imitate or to appreciate when imitated, especially at a public festival when a mixed crowd is gathered in a theater. For the feeling represented is one to which they are strangers. Certainly. Then the imitative poet who aims at being popular is not naturally made, nor is his art intended, to please or to affect the rational principle in the soul, but he will prefer the passionate and unpredictable temperament, which is easily imitated. Clearly. And now we may fairly take him and place him by the side of the painter, for he is like him in two ways, first, because his creations have a lesser degree of truth, in this, I say, he is like him, and he is also like him in being concerned with a lesser part of the soul, and therefore we shall be right in refusing to admit him into a well-ordered state, because he awakens and nourishes and strengthens the feelings and impairs the reason. 
As in a city, when the wicked are permitted to have authority and the good are put out of the way, so in the soul of man, as we maintain, the imitative poet implants an evil constitution, for he indulges the irrational nature which has no discernment of greater and lesser, but thinks the same thing at one time great and at another small, he is a manufacturer of images and is very far removed from the truth. Exactly. But we have not yet brought forward the heaviest count in our accusation, the power which poetry has of harming even the good, and there are very few who are not harmed, is surely an awful thing? Yes, certainly, if the effect is what you say. Hear and judge, the best of us, as I believe, when we listen to a passage of Homer, or one of the tragedians, in which he represents some pitiful hero who is drawling out his sorrows in a long speech, or weeping, and smiting his chest, the best of us, you know, delight in giving way to sympathy, and are in raptures at the excellence of the poet who stirs our feelings most. Yes, of course I know. But when any sorrow of our own happens to us, then you may observe that we pride ourselves on the opposite quality, we would rather be calm and patient, this is the courageous part, and the other which delighted us in the recitation is now deemed to be the part of a woman. Very true, he said. Now can we be right in praising and admiring another who is doing that which any one of us would detest and be ashamed of in his own person? No, he said, that is certainly not reasonable. Nay, I said, quite reasonable from one point of view. What point of view? If you consider, I said, that when in misfortune we feel a natural hunger and desire to relieve our sorrow by weeping and lamentation, and that this feeling which is kept under control in our own calamities is satisfied and delighted by the poets, the better nature in each of us, not having been sufficiently trained by reason or habit, allows the sympathetic element to break loose because the sorrow is another's, and the spectator fancies that there can be no disgrace to himself in praising and pitying anyone who comes telling him what a good man he is, and making a fuss about his troubles, he thinks that the pleasure is a gain, and why should he be arrogant and lose this and the poem too? Few persons ever reflect, as I should imagine, that from the evil of other men something of evil is communicated to themselves. And so, the feeling of sorrow which has gathered strength at the sight of the misfortunes of others is with difficulty repressed in our own. How very true! And does not the same hold also of the ridiculous? There are jokes which you would be ashamed to make yourself, and yet on the comic stage, or indeed in private, when you hear them, you are greatly amused by them, and are not at all disgusted at their unseemliness. The case of pity is repeated. There is a principle in human nature which is disposed to raise a laugh, and this which you once restrained by reason, because you were afraid of being thought a buffoon, is now let out again. And having stimulated the risible faculty at the theater, you are betrayed unconsciously to yourself into playing the comic poet at home. Quite true, he said. And the same may be said of lust and anger and all the other emotions of desire and pain and pleasure, which are held to be inseparable from every action, in all of them poetry feeds and waters the passions instead of drying them up. She lets them rule, although they ought to be controlled, if mankind are ever to increase in happiness and virtue. I cannot deny it. Therefore, Glaucon, I said, whenever you meet with any of the advocates of Homer declaring that he has been the educator of Greece, and that he is beneficial for education and for the ordering of human things, and that you should read him again and again and get to know him and regulate your whole life according to him, we may love and honor those who say these things. They are excellent people, as far as their lights extend, and we are ready to acknowledge that Homer is the greatest of poets and first of tragedy writers, but we must remain firm in our conviction that hymns to the gods and praises of famous men are the only poetry which ought to be admitted into our state. If we allow the sweet muse to enter, whether in epic or lyric verse, pleasure and pain will rule in our state, rather than law and reason. That is true, he said. Now, let us defend our decision to banish poetry from our state. We have a long-standing quarrel between philosophy and poetry, as evidenced by various sayings and signs of ancient enmity. However, we assure poetry and the sister arts of imitation that if they can prove their worth in a well-ordered state, we will gladly welcome them. But we must not betray the truth for the sake of charm. 
Glaucon, I'm sure you are as charmed by poetry, especially when it appears in Homer, as I am. Yes, indeed, I am greatly charmed. So, I propose that poetry be allowed to return from exile, but only if it can defend itself in lyrical or some other form of meter. Certainly. And we may also allow those who love poetry but are not poets to speak in prose on its behalf. Let them show not only its pleasure but also its usefulness to states and human life, and we will listen with kindness. If this can be proven, we will all benefit from poetry. Certainly, we will benefit. However, if poetry's defense fails, then like lovers who restrain themselves when their desires are opposed to their interests, we must give it up, though not without a struggle. We too are inspired by the love of poetry that noble states have instilled in us, and we want it to appear in its best and truest form. But if it cannot defend itself, we must be cautious and not fall into the childish love of poetry that captivates many. We know that the kind of poetry we have described cannot be taken seriously as attaining to the truth. Those who listen to it, fearing for the safety of their inner city, must be on guard against its seductions and make our words their law. Yes, I agree with you. Yes, my dear Glaucon, for there is a great issue at stake, greater than it appears, whether a person will be good or bad. And what profit is there if, under the influence of honor, money, power, or poetry, one neglects justice and virtue? Yes, I have been convinced by the argument as I believe anyone else would have been. But we have not yet mentioned the greatest rewards that await virtue. Are there greater rewards? If there are, they must be of unimaginable greatness. Why do you say that? What is great in a short time? The whole span of seventy years is nothing compared to eternity. Say rather, it is nothing. And should an immortal being seriously consider the short span rather than the whole? Certainly, the whole. But why do you ask? Are you not aware that the soul of man is immortal and imperishable? He looked at me in astonishment and said, No, by heaven. And are you truly prepared to argue this? Yes, I should be, and so should you. It is not difficult to prove. I see a great difficulty, but I would like to hear your argument. Listen then. I am listening. There is a thing you call good and another thing you call evil, right? Yes, he replied. Would you agree that the corrupting and destroying element is evil, while the saving and improving element is good? Yes. And you admit that everything has a good and an evil, like ophthalmia is the evil of the eyes and disease is the evil of the body, or mildew is the evil of corn and rot is the evil of timber, or rust is the evil of copper and iron. In almost everything, there is an inherent evil and disease. Yes, he said. And anything that is infected by these evils becomes evil itself and eventually dissolves and dies. True. The vice and evil that is inherent in each thing is the destruction of that thing. If this does not destroy them, then nothing else will, because good certainly will not destroy them, nor will that which is neither good nor evil. Certainly not. So, if we find a nature that has this inherent corruption but cannot be dissolved or destroyed, we can be certain that there is no destruction for that nature. That can be assumed. Well, I said, is there no evil that corrupts the soul? Yes, he said, there are all the evils that we were just discussing, unrighteousness, intemperance, cowardice, ignorance. But do any of these dissolve or destroy the soul? Let us not make the mistake of thinking that the unjust and foolish man perishes through his own injustice, which is an evil of the soul. Let's consider the analogy of the body. The wickedness of the body is a disease that weakens and destroys the body. And all the things we were discussing earlier come to destruction through their own corruption, which attaches to them and destroys them. Isn't that true? Yes, he replied. Think about the soul in the same way. Does the injustice or other evil that exists in the soul waste and consume her? Do they, by attaching to the soul and inhering in her, eventually bring her to death and separate her from the body? Certainly not, I said. 
But it is unreasonable to think that anything can perish from external evil that could not be destroyed from within by its own corruption. It is, he replied. Consider, Glaucon, that even if food is bad, whether it's stale, decomposed, or of poor quality, when confined to the food itself, it is not believed to destroy the body. Although, if the badness of the food causes corruption in the body, then we would say that the body has been destroyed by its own corruption, which is disease. But we absolutely deny that the body, being one thing, can be destroyed by the badness of food, which is another thing and does not cause any natural infection. Very true. And, following the same principle, unless some bodily evil can produce an evil of the soul, we must not think that the soul, which is one thing, can be dissolved by any external evil that belongs to something else. Yes, there is reason in that. Either then, let us refute this conclusion, or, while it remains unrefuted, let us never say that fever, or any other disease, or a knife to the throat, or even the dismemberment of the whole body, can destroy the soul until it is proven that the soul becomes more unholy or unrighteous as a result of these things being done to the body. But we cannot affirm that the soul, or anything else, if not destroyed by an internal evil, can be destroyed by an external one. And surely, he replied, no one will ever prove that the souls of men become more unjust as a result of death. But if someone who does not believe in the immortality of the soul denies this and claims that the dying do indeed become more evil and unrighteous, then, if the speaker is correct, I suppose that injustice, like disease, must be assumed to be fatal to the unjust. And those who suffer from this disorder die due to the inherent power of destruction that evil possesses, which kills them sooner or later, but in a different way from how the wicked currently receive death as the penalty for their actions. No, he said, in that case, if fatal to the unjust, injustice will not be so terrible to him, for he will be delivered from evil. But I suspect the opposite to be true. Injustice, if it has the power, will murder others, but it keeps the murderer alive and well awake. Its dwelling place is far from being a house of death. True, I said. If the inherent natural vice or evil of the soul is unable to kill or destroy her, then it is unlikely that something appointed to destroy another body will destroy a soul or anything else except that which it was appointed to destroy. Yes, that can hardly be. But if the soul cannot be destroyed by an evil, whether inherent or external, then it must exist forever. And if it exists forever, it must be immortal. Certainly. That is the conclusion. And if it is a true conclusion, then the souls must always be the same, for if none are destroyed, their number will not diminish. And they will not increase, for the increase of immortal beings must come from something mortal, and everything would eventually become immortal. Very true. But we cannot believe this. Reason does not allow us to, just as it does not allow us to believe that the soul, in its truest nature, is full of variety and difference and dissimilarity. What do you mean, he said? Perfectly clear? The soul, I said, being now proven to be immortal, must be the most perfect composition and cannot be made up of many elements. Certainly not. Her immortality is proven by the previous argument, and there are many other proofs. But to truly see her as she is, not as we currently see her, marred by her connection with the body and other miseries, you must contemplate her with the eye of reason, in her original purity. Then her beauty will be revealed, and justice, injustice, and all the things we have described will be more clearly manifested. So far, we have spoken the truth about her as she appears now. But we must also remember that we have only seen her in a condition that can be compared to the sea god Glaucus, whose true form is hardly discernible because his natural parts are broken off, crushed, and damaged by the waves in various ways. Seaweed, shells, and stones have grown over him, so that he looks more like a monster than his own natural self. And the soul that we see is in a similar condition, disfigured by ten thousand ills. But we must not look there, Glaucon, we must look elsewhere. Where then? At her love of wisdom. Let us see whom she affects, and what society and conversation she seeks by virtue of her close relationship with the immortal, eternal, and divine. 
Also, let us see how different she would become if she completely followed this superior principle, and if she were carried by a divine impulse out of the ocean in which she currently resides, and freed from the earthly things such as stones and shells that surround her because she feeds on earth and is overwhelmed by the material goods of this life. Then you would see her as she truly is, and you would know whether she has only one form or many, and what her nature is. I believe we have said enough about her loves and the form she takes in this present life. True, he replied. And thus, I said, we have fulfilled the requirements of the argument, we have not mentioned the rewards and glories of justice, which, as you were saying, can be found in Homer and Hesiod. But we have shown that justice, in her own nature, is best for the soul. Let a person do what is just, whether they possess the ring of Gyges or not, and even if, in addition to the ring of Gyges, they wear the helmet of Hades. Very true. And now, Glaucon, there will be no harm in further enumerating the many and great rewards that justice and the other virtues bring to the soul from gods and men, both in life and after death. Certainly not, he said. Will you then repay me what you borrowed in the argument? What did I borrow? The assumption that the just person should appear unjust and the unjust person just. You believed even if the true state of the case could not possibly escape the notice of gods and men, we should still make this admission for the sake of the argument, so that pure justice could be weighed against pure injustice. Do you remember? I would be greatly at fault if I had forgotten. Then, since the matter has been decided, I demand, on behalf of justice, that the esteem in which she is held by gods and men, and which we acknowledge to be her due, should now be restored to her by us. Since she has been shown to be real and not deceiving those who truly possess her, let what has been taken from her be given back, so that she may also receive the recognition she deserves and the appearance of justice that she gives to others. The demand is just, he said. First, I said, and this is the first thing that you will have to give back, the nature of the just and unjust is truly known to the gods. Agreed. And if they both know them, one must be the friend and the other the enemy of the gods, as we admitted from the beginning? True. And the friend of the gods may be supposed to receive the best things from them, except for the necessary consequences of past sins? Certainly. Then this must be our notion of the just person, that even when they are in poverty or sickness, or any other apparent misfortune, all things will ultimately work together for their good in life and death. For the gods take care of anyone whose desire is to become just and to be like God, as far as a human can attain the divine likeness through the pursuit of virtue. Yes, he said, if they are like God, they will surely not be neglected by him. And may we not suppose the opposite for the unjust person? Certainly. So, these are the rewards that the gods give to the just? That is my belief. And what do they receive from men? Look at things as they truly are, and you will see that the clever unjust are like runners who run well from the starting point to the goal, but not back from the goal. They start off at a great pace, but in the end, they only look foolish, slinking away with their tails, between their legs, without a crown. But the true runner reaches the finish line, receives the prize, and is crowned. And this is the same for the just person. If they endure to the end of every action and occasion throughout their entire life, they will have a good reputation and receive the prize that men have to offer. True. And now, you must allow me to repeat the blessings that you attributed to the fortunate unjust. I shall say of them, what you were saying of the others, that as they grow older, if they wish, they become rulers in their own city. They marry whom they like and give in marriage to whom they will. All that you said about the others, I now say about them. And, on the other hand, I say that the majority of the unjust, even if they escape punishment in their youth, are eventually found out and look foolish at the end of their lives. When they become old and miserable, they are scorned by both strangers and citizens. They are beaten, and then come those things that are unfit for polite ears, as you accurately described them. They will be tortured and have their eyes burned out, as you were saying. And you may assume that I have repeated the rest of your tale of horrors. But will you allow me to assume, without reciting them, that these things are true? 
Certainly, he said, what you say is true. These, then, are the prizes, rewards, and gifts that are given to the righteous by both gods and men in this present life, in addition to the other good things that justice provides on its own. Yes, he said, and they are fair and long-lasting. And yet, I said, all of these are insignificant in comparison to the rewards that await both the just and the unjust after death. And you should hear about them, so that both the just and the unjust will have received the full payment of the debt owed to them by the argument. Speak, he said, there are few things that I would more gladly hear. Well, I said, I will tell you a story, not one of the stories that Odysseus tells the hero Alcinous, but this is also a story of a hero, ere the son of Arminius, a Pamphylian by birth. He was killed in battle, and ten days later, when the bodies of the dead were already decaying, his body was found unaffected by decay and taken home to be buried. And on the twelfth day, as he lay on the funeral pyre, he came back to life and told them what he had seen in the afterlife. He said that when his soul left his body, he went on a journey with a large group and they arrived at a mysterious place where there were two openings in the ground, close together, and opposite them were two other openings in the sky. In the space between, there were judges seated, who commanded the righteous, after they had been judged and their sentences had been written down in front of them, to ascend by the heavenly path on the right side, and in the same way, the unjust were instructed by them to descend by the lower path on the left side, they also carried the symbols of their deeds attached to their backs. He approached, and they told him that he was to be the messenger who would bring the report of the afterlife to humans and they instructed him to listen and see everything that was to be heard and seen in that place. Then he saw and witnessed on one side the souls departing through either opening of heaven and earth after their sentences had been given, and at the two other openings, other souls, some ascending out of the earth dusty and tired from their journey, some descending out of heaven clean and bright. And as they arrived, they seemed to have come from a long journey, and they went forth with joy into the meadow, where they gathered like at a festival, and those who knew each other embraced and conversed, the souls from earth inquisitively asking about the things above, and the souls from heaven inquiring about the things below. And they shared with each other what had happened along the way, those from below weeping and sorrowful at the memories of what they had endured and seen in their journey beneath the earth, which lasted a thousand years, while those from above described heavenly delights and visions of unimaginable beauty. The story, Glaucon, would take too long to tell, but the summary was this, he said that for every wrong they had done to someone, they suffered tenfold, or once in a hundred years, since that was the length of a person's life, and the penalty was paid ten times in a thousand years. For example, if there were any who had caused many deaths, or had betrayed or enslaved cities or armies, or had been guilty of any other wicked behavior, for each one of their offenses, they received punishment ten times over, and the rewards for kindness, justice, and holiness were in the same proportion. I don't need to repeat what he said about young children dying shortly after birth. Concerning piety and impiety towards gods and parents, and concerning murderers, there were other and even greater retributions that he described. He mentioned that he was present when one of the spirits asked another, Where is Ardeus the Great? Now this Ardeus lived a thousand years, before Heir's time, he had been the ruler of a city in Pamphylia, and had murdered his elderly father and his older brother, and was said to have committed many other terrible crimes. The response of the other spirit was, he does not come here and will never come. And this, he said, was one of the terrifying sights that we ourselves witnessed. We were at the entrance of the cave, and after completing all our experiences, we were about to ascend, when suddenly Ardeus appeared along with several others, most of whom were tyrants, and there were also private individuals who had been great criminals, they believed that they were about to return to the upper world, but instead of allowing them to enter, the entrance roared whenever any of these incurable sinners or someone who had not been sufficiently punished tried to ascend, and then, wild men with fiery appearances, who were standing nearby and heard the sound, seized and carried them away, and Ardeus and others were bound by their head, feet, and hands, and thrown down and whipped, and dragged along the side of the road, their bodies scraped by thorns like wool, and to those passing. By, their crimes were declared, and it was announced that they were being taken away to be cast into hell.
And of all the many terrors they had endured, he said that there was none like the terror each of them felt at that moment, fearing that they would hear the voice, and when there was silence, one by one they ascended with immense joy. These, said Er, were the punishments and retributions, and there were also great blessings. Now when the spirits in the meadow had stayed for seven days, on the eighth day they were required to continue their journey, and four days later, he said that they arrived at a place where they could see from above a line of light, straight like a column, extending through the entire heaven and earth, with colors resembling the rainbow, only brighter and purer. Another day's journey brought them to the place, and there, in the midst of the light, they saw the ends of the chains of heaven. Hanging down from above, for this light is the belt of heaven, and it holds together the circle of the universe, like the undergirders of a trireme. From these ends, the spindle of necessity is extended, on which all the revolutions turn. The rod and hook of this spindle are made of steel, and the disc is made partly of steel and partly of other materials. Now the disc is in the shape of the disc used on earth, and the description of it implied that there is one large hollow disc which is quite scooped out, and into this is fitted another smaller one, and another, and another, and four others, making eight in total, like vessels which fit into one another, the discs show their edges on the upper side, and on their lower side all together form one continuous disc. This is pierced by the spindle, which is driven home through the center of the eighth. The first and outermost disc has the rim widest, and the seven inner discs are narrower, in the following proportions, the sixth is next to the first in size, the fourth next to the sixth, then comes the eighth, the seventh is fifth, the fifth is sixth, the third is seventh, last and eighth comes the second. The largest, or fixed stars, is spangled, and the seventh, or sun, is brightest, the eighth, or moon, colored by the reflected light of the seventh, the second and fifth, Saturn and Mercury, are in color like one another, and yellower than the preceding, the third, Venus, has the whitest light, the fourth, Mars, is reddish, the sixth, Jupiter, is in whiteness second. Now the whole spindle has the same motion, but, as the whole revolves in one direction, the seven inner circles move slowly in the other, and of these the swiftest is the eighth, next in swiftness are the seventh, sixth, and fifth, which move together, third in swiftness appeared to move according to the law of this reversed motion, the fourth, the third appeared fourth and the second fifth. The spindle turns on the knees of necessity, and on the upper surface of each circle is a siren, who goes round with them, hymning a single tone or note. The eight together form one harmony, and round about, at equal intervals, there is another band, three in number, each sitting upon her throne, these are the fates, daughters of necessity, who are clothed in white robes, and have chaplets upon their heads, Lachesis, and Clotho, and Atropus, who accompany with their voices, the harmony of the sirens, Lachesis singing of the past, Clotho of the present, Atropus of the future, Clotho from time to time assisting with a touch of her right hand the revolution of the outer circle of the disc or spindle, and Atropus with her left hand touching and guiding the inner ones, and Lachesis laying hold of either in turn, first with one hand and then with the other. When Air and the spirits arrived, their duty was to go at once to Lachesis, but first of all there came a prophet who arranged them in order, then he took from the knees of Lachesis lots and samples of lives, and having mounted a high pulpit, spoke as follows, hear the word of Lachesis, the daughter of necessity. Mortal souls, behold a new cycle of life and mortality. Your genius will not be allotted to you, but you will choose your genius, and let him who draws the first lot have the first choice, and the life which he chooses shall be his destiny. Virtue is free, and as a man honor or dishonors her he will have more or less of her, the responsibility is with the chooser, God is justified. When the interpreter had thus spoken, he scattered lots indifferently among them all, and each of them took up the lot which fell near him, all but Er himself, he was not allowed, and each as he took his lot perceived the number which he had obtained. Then the interpreter placed on the ground before them the samples of lives, and there were many more lives than the souls present, and they were of all sorts. There were lives of every animal and of man in every condition. And there were tyrannies among them, some lasting out the tyrant's life, others which broke off in the middle and came to an end in poverty and exile and beggary, 
and there were lives of famous men, some who were famous for their form and beauty as well as for their strength and success in games, or, again, for their birth and the qualities of their ancestors, and some who were the reverse of famous for the opposite qualities. And of women likewise, there was not, however, any definite character in them, because the soul, when choosing a new life, must become different. But there was every other quality, and all mingled with one another, and with elements of wealth and poverty, and disease and health, and there were mean states also. And here, my dear Glaucon, is the supreme peril of our human state, and therefore, the utmost care should be taken. Let each one of us leave every other kind of knowledge and seek and follow one thing only, if perhaps he may be able to learn and may find someone who will make him able to learn and discern between good and evil, and so to choose always and everywhere the better life as he has opportunity. He should consider the bearing of all these things which have been mentioned severally and collectively upon virtue, he should know what the effect of beauty is when combined with poverty or wealth in a particular soul, and what are the good and evil consequences of noble and humble birth, of private and public station, of strength and weakness, of cleverness and dullness, and of all the natural and acquired gifts of the soul, and the operation of them when conjoined, he will then look at the nature of the soul, and from the consideration of all these qualities he will be able to determine which is the better and which is the worse, and so he will choose, giving the name of evil to the life which will make his soul more unjust, and good to the life which will make his soul more just, all else. He will disregard. For we have seen and know that this is the best choice, both in life and after death. A person must take with them into the world below an unbreakable faith in truth and righteousness, so that they may not be blinded by the desire for wealth or other temptations of evil. This will prevent them from committing irreversible wrongs to others and suffering even worse themselves when faced with tyrannies and similar wickedness. They must also learn to choose moderation and avoid extremes, not only in this life, but in all that is to come. This is the path to happiness. According to the messenger from the afterlife, even the last person to choose can still have a happy and desirable existence if they choose wisely and live diligently. The first person should not be careless, and the last person should not despair. After these words, the person who had the first choice stepped forward and immediately chose the greatest tyranny. His mind was clouded by foolishness and indulgence, and he did not consider the consequences before making his choice. He did not realize at first that he was destined to commit terrible acts, including devouring his own children. When he had time to reflect and saw what his fate held, he began to regret his choice and lament his misfortune. Instead of taking responsibility for his actions, he blamed chance, the gods, and everything else except himself. This person was originally from heaven and had lived in a well-ordered society in a previous life, but his virtue was only a matter of habit, and he lacked true wisdom. Others who made similar mistakes were also from heaven and had never faced trials or difficulties. In contrast, the people who came from earth, having experienced suffering themselves and witnessed the suffering of others, were more cautious in their choices. Due to their lack of experience and the element of chance, many souls exchanged a good destiny for an evil one, or vice versa. If a person had dedicated themselves to sound philosophy from the beginning and had some luck with their lot, they could have a happy life here and a smooth and heavenly journey to another life and back. The messenger described the spectacle as both sad and laughable, as the choices of the souls were often based on their experiences in previous lives. For example, the soul that had once been Orpheus chose to be a swan out of hatred for women, as they had caused his death. The soul of Thamyras chose to be a nightingale, while birds like swans wanted to be humans. The soul that drew the twentieth lot chose to be a lion, and this was the soul of Ajax, who refused to be a man due to the injustice he had suffered. Agamemnon, who also hated human nature because of his own sufferings, chose to be an eagle. Atlanta, tempted by the fame of being an athlete, couldn't resist and chose that life. Epius, skilled in the arts, chose to be a crafty woman. Among the last to choose, the soul of the jester Thersites became a monkey. There were also instances of animals transforming into other animals and even into corresponding human natures, 
with the good becoming gentle and the evil becoming savage in various combinations. Once all the souls had made their choices, they went in the order of their selection to Lachesis, who sent the genius they had chosen to be the guardian and fulfiller of their lives. This genius led the souls to Clotho, who spun the threads of their destiny on her spindle, and then to Atropus, who made these threads irreversible. After passing beneath the throne of necessity, the souls marched in scorching heat to the barren plain of forgetfulness, devoid of trees and vegetation. At evening, they camped by the river of unmindfulness, whose water could not be contained in any vessel. Each soul was required to drink a certain amount, and those who lacked wisdom drank more than necessary. As they drank, they forgot everything. Now after they had gone to sleep, around midnight there was a thunderstorm and earthquake, and suddenly they were lifted in various ways to their birth, like shooting stars. He himself was unable to drink the water. But he couldn't explain how he returned to the body, only that, when he woke up suddenly in the morning, he found himself lying on the funeral pyre. And so, Glaucon, the story has been preserved and will save us if we obey the spoken word and we will safely cross the river of forgetfulness without defiling our souls. Therefore, my advice is that we always hold fast to the heavenly path and pursue justice and virtue, knowing that the soul is immortal and capable of enduring all kinds of good and evil. This way, we will live in harmony with each other and the gods, both while we are here and when, like victorious athletes in the games, we go around to collect our rewards. And we will be well in this life and in the thousand-year journey we have been describing. Summary of Chapter 10 In Chapter 10, Plato's exploration of justice culminates in a profound discussion about the impact of poetry and art on the human soul and the role of the philosopher as a guardian of knowledge and virtue. The chapter begins with Socrates expressing his concern about the negative influence of poetry and art on society. He argues that many forms of artistic expression, particularly those that depict the behavior of the gods and heroes, can corrupt the souls of individuals by promoting immoderate and irrational emotions. Socrates asserts that a just city should exercise censorship over artistic works to prevent their harmful effects. Plato's criticism of art extends to the portrayal of the afterlife where he argues that myths about the rewards and punishments in the underworld can mislead individuals into pursuing false values. He advocates for stories that emphasize the soul's immortality and the importance of virtue over material rewards. As the discussion progresses, Socrates delves into the nature of imitation, suggesting that all art is a mere imitation of reality and, therefore, an imitation of an imitation. He contends that artists do not possess true knowledge, but merely imitate what they perceive with their senses. This leads to a questioning of the value of artistic creation in the quest for wisdom and truth. The central message of chapter 10 is the philosopher's role as a guardian of knowledge and virtue. Socrates argues that the philosopher, who seeks the highest truths and understands the nature of the forms, is best equipped to guide society toward justice and the pursuit of the good life. Philosophers should be the rulers of the ideal city because they possess the wisdom and self-control necessary to make just decisions. In the final pages of The Republic, Plato's exploration of justice and the ideal city concludes with the affirmation that the philosopher king, the person who has ascended to the highest level of knowledge and virtue, is the embodiment of the just individual and the just society. The dialogue ends with a call for the philosopher to return to the cave of ignorance, enlightened and equipped to lead others toward the truth. Chapter 10 serves as a fitting conclusion to Plato's philosophical masterpiece, highlighting the transformative power of philosophy and the philosopher's role in shaping a just and virtuous society. It emphasizes the importance of truth, self-control, and the pursuit of wisdom as essential components of the ideal city and the well-lived life. Epilogue, Plato's Enduring Legacy Plato's profound influence on the course of human thought and governance extended far beyond his lifetime. His ideas, recorded in numerous dialogues and treatises, have left an indelible mark on philosophy, politics, and education. This epilogue provides a timeline of key moments and leaders who were profoundly affected by Plato's writings, highlighting their impact on future countries and societies. 
348-347 BC, Plato's passing. Plato, the Athenian philosopher, passes away, leaving behind a legacy of philosophical works, the most notable being the Republic and the Laws. 4th century BC influence on Aristotle. Plato's student, Aristotle, absorbed and expanded upon his master's teachings, laying the foundation for Western philosophy, ethics, and politics. Aristotle's ideas influenced Alexander the Great, who would later establish a vast empire spreading Hellenistic culture across Asia and the Middle East. 4th century BC Roman Republic Plato's writings on governance and the ideal state provided intellectual nourishment for the Roman Republic, particularly Cicero, the Roman orator and statesman. Cicero's advocacy for republican principles drew heavily from Platonic thought, shaping the early Roman Republic. 11th century C. Islamic scholars Plato's works, translated into Arabic, played a pivotal role in the Islamic Golden Age. Philosophers like Al-Farabi and Avicenna drew from Platonic ideas to advance political and ethical thought in the Islamic world. 15th century C. Renaissance Revival during the Italian Renaissance, Plato's texts were reintroduced to Europe, sparking a revival of interest in classical thought. Intellectuals such as Marsilio Ficino and Pico della Mirandola championed Platonic philosophy. 18th century CE American Revolution Plato's ideas on justice and the ideal state influenced the American founding fathers, particularly Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Concepts of democracy and checks and balances found resonance in the U.S. Constitution. 19th century CE Rise of Idealism Plato's philosophy underpinned German idealism, with thinkers like Immanuel Kant and G.W.F. Hegel drawing on his ideas to shape their own philosophical systems. 20th century CE Leaders and Thinkers Leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi inspired by Plato's concept of justice, utilized civil disobedience and nonviolent protest to advocate for civil rights and social justice. 21st century C. Global Impact Plato's ideas continue to shape contemporary political thought, with democratic ideals, the pursuit of justice, and the role of the philosopher king remaining subjects of debate and inspiration for leaders and thinkers worldwide. Conclusion Plato's writings, transcending centuries, and continents have found their way into the minds and hearts of leaders, philosophers, and activists. His enduring legacy serves as a testament to the enduring power of ideas, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations to envision and strive for a more just and enlightened society. Plato's impact continues to resonate in the ongoing pursuit of a better world. Facilitator I am Sir Adam S. Barnett, your facilitator. I've had the privilege of translating ancient wisdom from Old English to Modern English. I added chapters, titles, summaries, and an epilogue for your convenience. My journey involved crafting a program, AI assistance, and careful editing. My aim? To inspire you with the alchemy of philosophical thought. Adam S. Barnett